Resting at the heart of modern mathematics is the concept of infinite sets. The idea that you can put all of an infinity into a set and treat it as a completed totality. That's a difficult concept to wrap your mind around. And from the outside, it seems like it might be a little bit contradictory. But is it? Is there a way to make sense of an infinite set? Surely, with such a foundational concept, these ideas have been firmly established for the last 150 years, right? This is the question I'm trying to answer on the 45th episode of Patterson in Pursuit. Hello, my friends and enemies. Welcome to Patterson in Pursuit. I'm your host, Steve Patterson, and I know I say it every time, but for real, this is an awesome episode, and it's got a really cool story behind it, too. So occasionally I get emails from listeners and supporters who say, hey, you know, I saw you're going to be in this particular location, you want to get some lunch, or something like that, and it's always a blast. And a couple of weeks ago, I got an email from a guy who said, hey, I listened to some of your stuff on mathematics, I read some of your work on mathematics, and I'd like to talk to you about this. I'm an ex-mathematician, got my PhD from Oxford in mathematics, I specialize in set theory, which is the thing that I've been speaking about, and I thought, wow, this is a great opportunity, the guy's in Auckland, let's do it. And I said, hey, is it cool if I bring my microphone along? Because this conversation might be awesome, but it might be so awesome and so relevant that my listeners might want to listen to it. He said, yeah, that's cool. So what you're about to listen to is a conversation with a guy that I've never met, I knew nothing about, but he emailed me. He's got a background in math. He's a super cool. We hit it off right away. He's very knowledgeable, and the conversation was about as relevant to my work as possible. Depending on how closely you follow my written work, steve-patterson.com if you're interested, I get a lot of heat from people who say, oh, Steve, you just don't understand the basics of set theory or whatever the topic I'm talking about is. And in all circumstances, that's not true because I don't write about subjects that I don't know anything about. But I'm always open and eager to learn what is the error that I'm making in my understanding of set theory in particular, which I'm so critical of, modern set theory. And so whenever I get an opportunity to have a conversation with somebody that actually knows what they're talking about, as you'll discover, maybe, just maybe, my criticism and conceptual confusion is not so unjustified after all. What makes the conversation especially fantastic is that my sticking point has always been infinite sets. I like the idea of sets, but when you throw infinity into it, my brain kind of explodes, and I think there's some funny business going on. Well, the man I'm talking with specifically has got this background in mathematics, specifically in set theory, and he supports and believes in the coherence of the idea of infinite sets. So just an epic recipe for a conversation. Now, one of the drawbacks is because he's not in academia, he's outside of academia, though he's got his PhD, we didn't have an office or anything. So this was recorded outside of a coffee shop in downtown Auckland, New Zealand. So you're going to hear a lot of background noise, and it'll just be part of the ambience. Near the end, you'll hear some like background music um, turns on, and then we have to stop the interview because of that. But other than that, I'm sure if you guys are remotely interested in this topic, you are going to love this conversation. And if you're not interested in this topic, listen to it anyway, because you're going to discover something that I'm sure you'll find fascinating. But before we start, I want to give a shout out to another supporter and a company that hooked me and my wife up for a little bit while we were here in Auckland. We're leaving now, but one of the listeners of the show reached out and said, hey, Steve, you're in Auckland. I'm at this co-working space. If you want to come down, you know, I'll hook you up with a few days of this co-working space if you're tired of, you know, working in your apartment. And I was like, yep, let's do that. So special thank you to Max for helping my wife and I out. The co-working space, if you're in Auckland, go check it out. It's called Grid AKL. And it's a really sweet co-working space. My wife said it's the best co-working space that she's ever been in. And it's a really cool atmosphere. And I got to give a little talk um, to, to a group of people down there about podcasting. And they have a stable internet connection, which down here is fantastic. So special thanks to you guys. And also, before we start the show, let me tell you about the sponsor of the show, Praxis. Because, yet again, it is immediately relevant. There's a growing movement of professionals and even intellectuals now who are explicitly working outside of academia because the cost is astronomical to get your degree and the benefit is marginal and sometimes negative. 
I'm somebody who's interested in the world of ideas. I'm working outside of academia. My guest this week, Gareth, has a PhD in mathematics from Oxford, and he's chosen to work outside of academia. He thinks he can make a bigger, more positive impact in the world outside the academy. And the sponsor of the show, Praxis, is a company that specializes in taking young people and jump-starting their career without the college degree. It's a nine-month program which starts with three months of a professional boot camp where you learn actually relevant real-world information that will help you on your job. And then it's followed by six months of a paid apprenticeship. After you complete the program, they contractually guarantee you a job offer, and the net cost of the entire program is zero dollars. Yes, that's right. That is the kind of real education and training that you can get outside the academy in the modern world. So if that sounds like something you're interested in, go to steve-patterson.com slash Praxis. That'll take you to their website where you can put in your email address, get a free Praxis module. You can schedule a call with them. Check it out. It is the wave of the future, and I highly recommend it. So without further ado, we venture into the world of mathematics, dealing with questions in the foundations of mathematical reasoning with my new friend, Gareth. I'd like to pick your brain on a few issues. Maybe we can lay out some basics, some of the foundational issues and topics in mathematics. Sure. And maybe some of your own experiences in academia, if somebody's interest, interested in math. So there's a very popular idea from people who don't have any kind of formal education in mathematics yeah. that mathematics is kind of the perfect intellectual discipline. Everything is crystal clear. Uh, logically explained from beginning to end, all the theories are rigorously proved, there's no room for um, doubt or discussion, especially when we're talking about foundational issues. Mm -hmm. And then the more you learn about mathematics, the more you realize, oh, that's not the case. In fact, that's never really been the case. There's always been discussions about foundational issues in mathematics. So mm -hmm. one of the issues, which is st consist my sticking point, that I know modern math is supposed to have resolved 150 years ago is about infinities, okay. which might seem abstract to people, but really the issue of infinities is kind of absolutely central in mathematics and how you generate like the continuum or the number line. Yeah. But also historically, it's kind of a central issue because modern set theory, which is a huge part of modern mathematics, is built on the idea of what we call the completed infinity or the infinite set, that that's a thing. Yeah. So help, help me mm -hmm. work through the logic of an infinite set. Because when I think of infinite, I think of the concept of infinity, I think never ending, endless, and then I think of set, and I think of complete. Mm -hmm. So it seems straight off the bat like that's kind of a, kind of like a contradictory thing to say an infinite. It's like a square circle. Yeah. So help me work through that. Okay. okay. So I guess my first thought on the, uh, the idea that the infinite sets that mathematicians are studying and playing with this actualized infinity, um, I, I don't see that the same kind of immediate contradiction drops out when considering that concept, because if it were, then you'd be able to take, say, the axioms of set theory and construct a quite short, neat, simple proof that it's broken, something like a, a Russell's paradox, mm -hmm. but for the existing mm -hmm. rules of set. And let me, uh, let me interject so for people who aren't aware of that. Russell's paradox is the set of all sets which do not contain themselves. This is supposed to be a logical contradiction that shows that naive set theory, as it's been called, is yes. internally inconsistent and yields a contradiction. So okay. So I feel my first thought is feeling that um, that kind of argument, uh, what the mathematician, who, the set theorist, let's say, to be more precise, means when they talk about uh, an infinite set uh, and what we might be think, what you might be thinking of when you say something which is infinite yeah. and which is a set contained. Yeah. You know, that they're one or both of those are not quite talking about the same thing. Okay. I can't quite, I certainly can't imagine that all these people that could easily be building on some sort of wonky foundation, that it would be that wonky that actually there's just this obvious yeah. three or four line proof that breaks all of set theory as sure. it stands. So that's the first <laughs> thing I'm thinking about it. Um, so let me, let me uh, yes. respond to that just for a moment. So sure. I've spoken with some mathematicians who say that, oh well they say, well if there's a logical contradiction then show the inconsistency, show the proof where you yield the contradiction. And my okay. claim is kind of one step prior to that, it's not even a, a mathematical proof that yields a contradiction, it's that the foundational concept itself is contradictory. So it's like, 
is an infinite set of contradiction is not something that requires mathematical proof, just conceptual analysis. Okay. Something that is never ending, never complete, so then, never bounded with something that Okay, but is then complete. would it be yeah. your contention then that this is some sort of like a, a fundamental logical contradiction which cannot be reduced to something like um, P and not P? Is something that a mathematician would respond to and say, yes, that, that can't be. I mean, we're not physicists. That's here. very. Mm, is that a different? Okay, so, so put it this way. Yeah. Insofar yeah. as you could have a contradiction that would look like a square circle, yeah. it's not necessarily P and not P, yeah. but packed into the concept of square and packed into the concept of circle, there is mutual exclusivity. If okay. it, even it can't be elicited necessarily in that kind of so form. Then of it feels as though packed into the definition of set, yeah. you have this. Uh, you could add an axiom, let's say, and this axiom is say that uh, any proper subset of it must be not equinumerable or there'll be no bijection or something to say that it must be finite. But if you build that axiom in, it will be consistent with everything else, but okay. it will be inconsistent with the infinite set axiom. Okay, so let's, so I guess it, it, maybe it comes down to fundamental concepts of what we mean by set. Yeah, okay. okay so let's talk what, about sets. Yeah, what do we mean by that word? What do you mean by that? Well, what do I mean by that, I guess? <laughs> um, well, okay, so let's just go through the, the story again. I grow up, I learn English, I know what a set is, but actually if you look up in the Oxford English Dictionary, there are many different meanings, people mean different things by it. It's used in many different contexts, it has some sort of you know, flavor to it, that's fine. And when I come up to mathematicians that are talking about a set, a mathematical set, and I say, well, what precisely do you mean by that? There's some sort of definitional process going on there. Um, you know, they say it's a thing which satisfies these postulates. Okay. So then I start from that and I say, okay, well, Let's take that as a definition for now and work from there uh, and see if I can understand more about this thing set. Okay? Now as I try to make sense of those definitions, I'm piecing in my mind some sort of conception, my own idea, I fill in the blanks. Yeah. Later I can find out, oh, actually that was the wrong picture or, oh, that was a good picture. And it also helps me to predict future results that I might be able to prove with yeah. the axiom system. But yeah, I'm basically treating the axioms that they set as a definition of set. And so if you mm. take one of the axioms away, you're getting a different kind of set. Mm. Now, yeah, that strikes me like a bit of a dangerous methodology. Okay, why Because so? imagine I were to try to say, try to define what a circle is, mm -hmm. or, or a square, yeah. with some particular formal criteria. Yeah. And embedded in them, I say, you know, satisfies the criteria, let's say, of a square, it has four equivalent sides. Yeah, something like that. And also nestled somewhere in there as a, it has no sides. Yeah. Circle. Now, I guess that might look like a formal contradiction, but yeah. that seems like a kind of backwards way of going about defining something. So if I say, what is a, s well, a yes. set? Because here's what happens. Yeah. In common language, yeah. We talk about sets, pretty yeah. straightforward. A set can be understood as a collection of discrete elements. Yeah. And if that's okay. all that it is, when I, I think that's what most people mean by it. Yeah. And even mathematicians, they use that kind of language because they talk yeah. about the cardinality of the set. The cardinality of the set is how many objects are in they part of that certainly use other terms like cardinality to fit yeah. in with this intuitive notion of set. Right, exactly. Okay. So. So is the, is the claim then that the intuitive notion of set yeah. is something that we should, we should get away from and we should just try to formally have the definition that is just formally defined within the mathematics itself? Well, I don't, firstly, I wouldn't suggest that the, the axioms as written would, would fully define this thing set anyway. Uh, okay. You've got this incompleteness anyway. So, but I guess when I wanted to jump in with the square and say yes and no, I feel that when you, we're talking about I guess it's um, it's almost like a difference between applied and pure in a sense that, that firstly there are the rules of the game and as a pure mathematician I like to just take the rules of the game and play with them. That's the part of maths that's very yeah. pure and I'm not making any errors. If errors have been made, they've been by many people that have set these axioms or whatnot, okay? okay? So long as they're not logically contradictory. And then there's the other yeah, the other approach, uh, the, the other important component of that which is to to look at the real world and then come up with some rules or some idea about what maps we might see a physical thing that looks a lot like a square and then have yeah. this idea about equal angles and then mm -hmm. try to formulate that and mm -hmm. say, okay, so if that's a square and that's a circle, what more can you tell me about these objects? And then I can do some I can do some pure mathematics and then they can see, you know, does that actually correspond mm -hmm. to these objects in the real world? 
the thing is, in the real world, I don't see that there are any things like sets. Yeah. Though I don't see that there is a logical, logical reason to say that you know it's impossible um, for them conceptually to exist. So, so I what about? Don't, I don't believe they do exist. In the what world. about something like this, though? Yeah. A set exists as yeah. a mental construction, as abstract boundaries yeah. around discrete things. So yeah. I could okay. say, you know, we've got a chair here, we've got a cup of coffee here. Yeah. The set of the chair and the cup of coffee, right? So it's got okay. it's got two elements in it. Sure. In a sense the set exists, it exists in my mind. It's a conceptual tool. But that's no problem. I could make the set as large as I want. I could say the set includes all of the individual atoms which compose those two things. Okay, well that's still a discrete thing. Yeah. But Insofar as that's the concept, yeah. it, that must be mutually exclusive with the idea of a set that has a never-ending amount of elements. I yeah, can't yeah, yeah. possibly conceive I, of I all that. I think I'll go with you on that. I'll go so far as in so far as we're talking about this kind of set. We're talking okay. about a set with of, of things in the universe, in, in space, of some kind. Okay. And yeah. Um, for our universe, I don't I don't believe in the existence of infinitely many things, if, okay. if that makes sense, or, or, or well, sure. that, that things exist without end. Um, although I'm sure there, there are plenty of people who disagree with me. You know, okay. it's either space is infinite or time is infinite or something. Sure. But yeah, uh, I'll go so far as to say that, yeah, uh, metaphysically, um, I don't have a, a logical problem with it, uh, like the universe existing in that way. I just don't happen to believe that. Mm. But well, yeah, so let, if we let, take that concept, yeah. I don't think that what the mathematicians are studying when they're studying sets in set theory is the same thing as what you and I would talk about when we say the set containing this and that. Okay. We're talking about finite sets. Okay. As a mathematician, set theorists will call that finite sets. Okay. And there's an entire theory of finite sets and it stacks up quite well against this intuition. So do you think, I think this gets to, to one of these fundamental metaphysical differences okay. in mathematics. Mm -hmm. If it's true that sets exist, let's say, in our mind, yeah. and they don't exist separate of our mind, then okay. How could you have any set, even if it's not in this world, let's say it's in the platonic mathematical world, mathematical universe, could it be that you're talking about a set that is a construction and yet contains an infinitely large amount of elements in it? Or does that necessarily presuppose it's separate of our minds, it's not a construction anymore? Well, I guess I would be... Uh Depends precisely what you mean by construction, but my intuition would say at the moment that yes, that there's no particular problem with constructing and completing an actualized kind of infinite thing. Um, really? But yeah, I just don't. I mean, it depends on. It's like if we if we try uh, trying to construct this thing and saying, okay, we'll take uh, an empty bag. And we use a new word now, just to because we've got set so many times in collections. Okay. Sure. And I'll put a ball in the bag, and I'll put sure. another ball in the bag, and I'll put another ball in the bag, and I'll. Yeah. Right. There's no way this is ever actualized. This is only a potentially real okay. infinity. But if I could somehow conceive of the concept of a bag containing infinitely many, if you like, or uh, more than any finite number of balls. Of what does it mean to say infinitely many, as if it's an actualized? Doesn't that imply it's, that it's, it's an a, actualized amount? It, well, I, I'm saying uh, I'm actualizing it in a kind of a constructing it in a different way. It's not it's not constructing in the way of constructivist mathematics. But I'm just saying it depends what you mean by constructed. Could you have it's a like, full and complete conception of yeah. the bag containing an infinitely many number of elements? A full and complete conception. Yeah. Yeah, I think so. I think it's a bag. It has these balls in them. You can see that it has balls in them. You can take a ball out, but you know also that no matter how many times you take a ball out, there are still balls remaining in the bag. Are there the same amount of balls in the bag after Each you take time. one out? Yeah. Now, does that, that make sense to you to say that we have a well, not, amount? Well, it depends what you mean by amount, because if we're talking about amount, meaning kind of finite amount, then no, it wouldn't make sense. Well, then what, amounts don't do So that. what is the infinite so, amount? So that, yeah. that's a concept I don't understand, okay. infinite amount, because yeah. you can take one ball out, but the same amount remains. So how does that work? Yeah, I guess amount is probably a very poor choice of word, let's say. Um, it's got the same cardinality is all I can really jump back to. Okay, but it's, what, it's what, now maybe becoming circular. You know, so but yeah. that's that's Go the ahead. thing, right? Yeah. So if I agree that they would say that mathematicians would say it has the same cardinality. What's cardinality? Okay. Like I understand cardinality yeah, yeah. in I know in you get the bijections. The, the, in, the, like in the uh, intuitive sense, okay. cardinality totally crystal clear. But then when it goes into the infinite world, that concept explodes in my mind because then I think amount. If you remove a bowling ball from the bag, yeah. there is exactly one less amount of things in your bag. But that somehow doesn't work when we're talking about cardinality. Yeah, 
I don't know. I, there's, I'll have to admit, at this point, there is an element to which you know I was in Oxford for nine years studying. So, as you know, you learn the environment that you're in yeah. and whatnot. And card analysis is very much one of those things that I can quite happily take my one away from Alex Zero and be left with Alex Zero. <laughs> so it's difficult for me to fight past that. But at okay. the same time, I no. think it it doesn't fit amount very well. I think amount's a poor choice of word for what it is. I want to I want to yeah. clarify for the for the listeners. Sure. When you said Alex Zero, there's this idea in set theory that you have different sizes of infinity, mm -hmm. and the smallest size of infinity is is Alex Zero, which is supposed to be the set of all is it all natural numbers, um, and it's got a bunch of weird quirks, which is you can subtract individual elements from Aleph Zero, and you're still left with Aleph Zero. You can even add Aleph Zero to itself, and it's still Aleph Zero. You have all of these, what appear to me, logically contradictory things. And when I've investigated this, and I, I, I research it, a lot of people say something like, well, it doesn't fully make sense, but you get used to it as a mathematician. Like Everybody kind of agrees that this is how it, things are done. Well, but I wouldn't go so far as that it doesn't really make sense. Well, I'm saying for me it doesn't. All right, okay, yeah. fine. Yeah. Yeah. Well, I, I will admit that uh, going through, I think there have been other mathematicians around me that have made precisely this kind of comment before, and on many other areas as well. Right. That it's not something you ever really understand, it's just something that you get used to. Right, that's the phrase. It's like, <laughs> and I, I, I was kind of quite shocked and appalled almost at the first time someone said it to me, because I very much felt like I was understanding. Okay. Um, I don't feel as though it's contradicting itself, but I think that amount doesn't stack up quite well. I quite like those early thought experiments, trying to bring myself back to sort of secondary school of, you know, like, um, uh, I forget all of the classic examples. I guess one of the old ones is, uh, you know, just considering the natural numbers, the counting numbers, one, two, three, four, mm -hmm. and then writing just below them, or you have written all of them, of course, you wrote the first eight or so, and below them you write their squares. Uh, this is something that Galileo, I think, uh, was considering at some point, and just considering that actually, there was a, a correspondence, a one-to-one -one correspondence between each number and its square, and therefore it seems that for some sense of amount, if it were to apply to infinity, would have to have that the square numbers were the same as the But doesn't, doesn't that imply... Despite that the fact that there are clearly fewer. <laughs> but but do, yeah. doesn't that imply that those numbers exist separate of their being conceived? Because any one of those, one, any one of those lists that you make, yeah. it, it terminates wherever it terminates. You yeah, can't just write... Yeah, you list to eight. Yeah. For the yeah. purposes of this, yeah. but but in, in that circumstance, yeah. right? So so like with Cantor's proof, for example, yeah. where supposedly you have the list going infinitely this direction, infinitely that direction. If somebody were to say, well, numbers don't exist out there; numbers are constructions in our minds. How do you how do you get to that that leap to say, oh, well, it's just oh, like I the see. correspondence between numbers and their squares, but that correspondence okay. exists when it's being constructed. All right, well, I guess, I guess there's a few different ways to look at it. Um, I guess when I'm pushed to it, because I look at these uh, conceptualizations of, say, Cantor's diagonal arguments and whatnot, and um, often I find it's quite, it's not presented in a way that's particularly, you know, um, that, that would be a place where you can see all kinds of uh, <laughs> dubious things being done with infinity. The first time you come across that, it's like, what's going on here? It's, it doesn't quite add up. Um, I guess. The way that I, I argue something like that um, actually doesn't really have to leave, uh, doesn't have to actually do actualized infinities at all. You can okay. do the whole thing with potential. Really? Yeah, I think so. Okay. I feel so. I mean, okay, so we can have a procedure. I mean, maybe we can't actualize the inf infinity of all the natural numbers, but we could have a procedure which enumerates and we can say one and then add one. And add one could be our procedural operation. And we okay. can learn to do this repeatedly, okay. and we can do as many as we like. So there's a procedure for generating the sequence one, two, three, four, and so on. Okay. I quote in air quotes there. Um, and equally, we can speak of procedures as finite objects. In, in some sense, we can talk of a procedure as being a, a rule written down in a finite amount of space that we can okay. communicate. Um, and we can come up with other procedures for generating numbers. We could, for example, the even numbers, or the square numbers, or the prime numbers. There's lots of different procedures out there for an increasing sequence of numbers. Mm -hmm. So then I think, um, well, can we enumerate um, procedures? And we can indeed. We can, we can, you know, do the, for example, the natural numbers, and then the even numbers, and then the multiples of three, and then the multiples of four. We yeah, can do a more advanced kind of enumeration of procedures. But even yeah. when you say that, that you say the even numbers. Yeah, I say that. But, I'm but, air quoting some of these. Yeah. But even the way, and I, I see yeah. this throughout mathematical thinking and literature, is they. It's like assuming that they exist. Already. Assuming that yeah. they exist rather than... So when we write 7 down, 
Yeah. I don't think it's the case that we're referencing some entity out there, just like if I were to say, I don't know, the, the, the table. No, that I, is don't, an I external don't think that either, really, you know. But if you don't, I still don't, that I, I don't how, do you get to the, how do you get to the infinity? If everything is just constructed, and yeah. all that mathematics is is a description of you know, finite rules and what the finite rules yeah. generate, how do you ever get to an actualized infinity? I mean, you can't conceive of all of an infinity at once. That would be... No, you don't conceive of the individual. No, that, that's not what I'm seeing at all. So, but, but rather an object which is like a, a limit of some kind, if you will, or uh, of the procedure. I mean, but, something to fill a gap. But if you don't conceive of all the infinities, mm -hmm. if you never conceive of all the infinities, does, yeah. wouldn't we say, therefore, actualized, there's no such thing as an actualized infinity? Well, well, yeah, I think that if, if you're pushing me to the point of saying that these things are, you're actually conceptualizing all of the points. Mm -hmm. If not, then what you've got there is just a, a finite object with a particular kind of flavor or relationship to other finite objects. Yes, let me give you an analogy. Yeah, then, then that's fine. I mean, I'm quite happy with considering omega, which is susceptible natural numbers in set theory, as they say, um, to be a finite object in that, in that in, in the sense of when you look back and you just look at it from a kind of formalist perspective of symbols and manipulation, everything's a finite length of proof, everything's a finite... Uh, but it wouldn't have an yeah. actually infinite amount of elements to that. No, so. but what would happen is that there would be a concept called infinity within the finite language and structure. But it's not a concept of the actualized infinity, it's a concept of being able to produce more finite elements, right? It, it would probably look more like that, yes, than of, well, it, again, it's like, um, it's, it's not actualized, and if I again think of the logical symbols, it's not as if I can say one and two and three, um, sorry, P of one and P of two, where P is a statement of claim, and P of three and P of four and P, of, you know, you can, uh, an infinite length, whatever that might mean. I'm, I'm kind of with you on that. It's got to be a finite length statement right. for it to be, even, you, yeah. You can't reference right, it. Right, exactly, yeah. exactly. No, I, I get that, but I feel like, sitting here and talking with our finite language and finite concepts, we can talk about this concept of infinity and, and have a sensible discussion about it without breaking into contradiction somehow. I feel like there's, there's a sense of infinity embedded in that finite constructual framework that is useful, and it might be much closer to a kind of potential infinity than a realized one. So let me, yeah. let me give you an analogy that I like to use and see yeah. if you think this breaks down when it's important sure. okay, go ahead. Okay. Yeah. I like to use the analogy of language, of natural language, that I could I could use the concept of, I could say something like, there is no inherent limit to the size of sentence that I can create. For yeah. any given sentence, I can add more words. Yes. Now, but in a sense, I could say, oh, there's an infinite number of sentences out there. In one sense, I could say that. Mm -hmm. But that doesn't mean that there exists some sentence of an actually infinite size. No, it certainly doesn't. But, but, so I would import this into the mathematics conversation. I would say there is no number which is so big that you cannot conceive of a greater number but yeah, that doesn't mean there is kind of there's no I mean, actualized infinite number or set or anything really that's out there I, I see where you're, you're the problem that you're coming in with is yeah. and I, I do have the same kind of aversion to that okay and it's kind of a conceptual problem I found particularly because of course when you're doing the PhD you're teaching students as well yeah, and, and, and sometimes they come along with this notion of yes. just and, and they end up doing something which looks like they're trying to do infinitely many steps to make their argument work. And, right. You know, <laughs> That's I want to say, no, your, your proofs have got to be finite. Right. So, so, you know, please phrase this differently. Okay, so one yeah. more question on this, and then I, I want to talk to you about the academia thing. Mm -hmm. Let's return to this notion. You said you don't like the idea of amount, because amount seems to imply, embedded in the concept of amount, yeah. I think, yeah. is finite. I don't yeah. think you can I, rescue the concept of so. So, what is the mathematic, the higher mathematical alternative to amount that will include infinity? Well, I mean, I guess we keep touching on that word cardinality, but really, I kind of want to stick with that and suggest that okay, there is this um, logical framework uh, with rules that is ZFC effectively, and it. And in that, we have a whole bunch of objects, and we can do arbitrarily consider arbitrarily many of these objects um, at any one particular time. And uh, how do I phrase this elegantly? But cardinality yeah. in particular. So say, so, okay, we're replacing amount with cardinality. Okay, unpack okay. the concept of cardinality yeah. for me. I want to suggest that cardinality 
within this system, I mean, within the system, we have objects which we call finite and other objects which we call infinite. Okay. And in a cardinality, which is this term that we've defined, applies equally to both. Okay. And if we apply the t concept of cardinality to these objects which are finite, okay, then it very much looks like what we're talking about when we talk about numbers and amounts. Okay. Uh, which is another abstraction that people talk now, about. Now, but when you say you're applying the concept of cardinality, yeah. it sounds like you're... Okay. I have conceptualized you have cardinality in some sense, yes. Right, so what is the concept that you're applying? I can understand and say there is this kind of mathematical rule that we symbolize as cardinality. Yeah, yeah. But that's no, I get not that. the concept. So no, what no, is no, that I'm concept? talking about the fact that when I do mathematics, and I'm coming back to this point again, um, Yes, there are the formal symbols, but I don't just think in terms of the symbols and right. then applying a new right. one. Of I actually you know, try to visualize, if you like, certain yes. objects in this space, right. in my head, in certain ways, yes. and try to build an intuition slowly with, with months or years about what they might or might not do, right. uh, how they interact with each other, how you, know, how you can take two infinite sets and intersect them, what does that mean? Um, in terms of this intuition that I have, and I can see my fellow mathematician across the way, and he also has spent a long time building this intuition and you know he can play with these things in his head and he'll come up with some idea i think that this is a true statement mm -hmm. and then i can think in my own head about my own particular and i can say no i think it's a false statement and we can actually debate this point mm -hmm. um, and we can actually go back to the axioms and try to work out who's correct and it might turn out that actually the, the statement is neither provable nor its negation is provable in the, the axioms actually both have just different models of these particular objects so i don't want to go out there and suggest that there is sets as a, like an objective thing, but rather you, you build a model yourself of, of something that begins to satisfy these properties. So I can't really describe sets much more than they have these properties and maybe I can draw some pictures of the sorts of things that I visualize, but you will see the same kinds of pictures in most mathematical texts but with, with magic ellipses and things going on. You know. So, but with the cardinality in particular. Yeah. How is, the, how is it that you conceive of that? Because it's, yeah. it's crystal clear to me when I yeah. read about cardinality, when I read about, yeah, when I read about cardinality as applied to anything finite, yeah. it is a crystal clear concept. But, it, but like I said, it gets exploded when I'm talking when it, it, it's okay. infinity. So w something in the concept of cardinality changes when we're moving from finite to infinite. So yeah. how is it that you, how is it that that concept gets, we can use it Everybody, everybody, even if they don't have a background in mathematics, your average yeah, yeah, person yeah. on the street can understand cardinality in about 15 seconds. C certainly for finite things, yeah. So then how, how is it that you, how is it that that concept gets imported coherently and how can somebody who's struggling with it understand if it even makes sense when applied to infinite things or supposed yeah. infinite things? Okay. How could I help somebody who was struggling to work out what cardinality could even mean and I felt that it was totally nonsensical when applied to infinite Which stuff. Be, How could I could explain to them <laughs> what I actually meant by that? Yeah. I feel like, I, I feel almost as though if they're having a conceptual issue with cardinality in that they don't feel like it could possibly logically make sense, mm -hmm. um, then I'd encourage them to try to um, not preload cardinality with the, the intuitive sense of amount too much. But rather, let's just let's just leave that to one side and, and come up with a new new property, cardinality or something. Okay. And we'll just um, that's just a property that we apply to each set. It's just a label. It has no particular relationships. Okay. And then from that, I would start to build up the. Let's have a look at these interesting relationships we can build from them. And hey, look at that. When I apply it to this subclass, which we'll call finite sets, mm. it looks just like cardinality. So I would always encourage them to come up with this new concept, which really isn't amount. You know, it's almost like the word cardinality is misleading. But I don't feel like it's contradicting itself. I feel like it's well. It's not the, the cardinality isn't contradicting itself yeah. unless you apply it, my, from my perspective, to the, this notion of infinity. But what you, what you yeah. said is interesting. So it sounds yeah. like you're saying there is a higher level concept of cardinality, and you can. It's got two parts. Yeah. It's got the finite part. And it's got the infinite part. When you import that concept into the infinite part, it makes sense. Everybody, you know, everybody yeah. on the street would get it. But when you import it into the Infinite, uh, infinite part, discussion. Yeah, so. That's where things start get they get much less intuitive. So, yeah. the, but the trouble that I have with that yeah. is it seems circular to me. It, and I've spoken with many mathematicians about this, and they say 
essentially it almost comes down to well, look, it works in the it works in the calculation. Wow. You can do things with it. It's so massively practical. And if you don't grasp it, well, that's just and that's just your problem. Well, I, I wouldn't go that far. Experiment. There's an awful lot of different ways you can go about establishing most of what is useful mathematics. You can do it constructivist style, you can yeah. do it formalist style. You don't need to conceive of infinite sets of, I mean, heck, as you say, they were introduced 150 years ago. It's not as if we had no mathematics. <laughs> 150, we had plenty of mathematics. Right. And a lot of the stuff that's been done, you know, it's almost as though a lot of the very kind of high level abstract, you know, talking about much larger cardinalities, compactness, interacting with little earthness and doing all weird things. Much of that, you can you can wind it back and look at it from a, well, here's a, a finite sentence and we're, we're doing these particular manipulations and kind of sidestep the whole issue. Mm -hmm. um, sometimes you do go deeply enough into Ramsey theory, you actually find that you're really using the assumption of their existing infinite set to prove something that you otherwise would not be able to prove right. about finite things, oh, which now, is weird. Now, can but, you yeah. explain that? Because I don't know very much about that. So yeah. what are the things in mathematics that you're proving about finite things that presuppose the axiom of infinity? OK. Um, now, unfortunately, these things get a bit a bit complicated, so I, I'd love to give you a very simple example, but I think I'll try the simplest one I can, sure. which I think would be something like the, I'll call it the, the strong finite Ramsey theorem, which okay. I guess you can call the strong Ramsey theorem. Okay. <laughs> um, but unfortunately, it's one of those things where it's, uh, the statement is, for all x there exists a y, such that for all z there exists a w, such that something. Okay. So it's of that form, okay. okay? But all of the x, y, z, and w are finite things, and the something is a finite thing. Okay. Okay. Um, okay. And it's a statement which is has been shown to be not provable in um, in Iano arithmetic, in the sense that uh, that statement in its own right would be able to prove the consistency of Iano yeah. arithmetic, and though by through the so this is kind of like a girdle yeah. sentence, like a girdle thing. kind of yeah. thing, yeah. So you can prove that this thing cannot be proved from just the axioms of Iano arithmetic. Um, However, it is, uh, it's claimed, you can find people say, but it is true. When they say it's true, it means they derived it from ZFC. So mathematicians have this habit of saying something's true um, just because it's derived from ZFC, which is obviously true. Okay. So but the point <laughs> is, is that if you add in that, that axiom of infinity, and actually I followed the proof, it looks like you also want to throw choice in to make this proof work. Right? But infinity plus another axiom to do with infinity. Um, then you can show this thing follows. But it doesn't follow just from piano arithmetic, which suggests to me that there is another model of piano arithmetic in which the statement is false. Mm. So whether or not you can say it's true or false, I guess most mathematicians would say it is true because in my conception of what the natural numbers mean, and I believe in these actualized infinities and various things, that this statement is true. Mm. You know, I can see that it's true. I can reason that it's true. But I guess it's, it's quite possible that a person that you know, has enough of this uh, uh, a finite and formalist mind view would actually analyze the statement and say, you know what, this is a false statement. And mm. the reason your proof doesn't work is because you've assumed that there exists an actualized infinity. OK. Right? Uh, but because it's like, for all there exists, for all there exists kind of thing, it's not like um, a simple Goldbach's conjecture thing where you can just say, well, OK, here's 9 and 10, and they're your counterexample or something. OK, so yeah. with that concept of the actualized infinity, this is something I'm still, tr in my own research, I'm trying to wrap my head around. Yeah. It seems like, as you said, you can build a huge amount of mathematics without infinities. Yeah, yeah. However, it also seems like, at least modern mathematics, there's also a huge amount of mathematics that presupposes the actualized infinity. I know you said you have a background in like topology. Yeah, which seems very to be an so, area yeah. where you and the axiom of choice indeed. You have the, yeah. the you got to have. Well, for those who are unfamiliar, topology. How would you describe it? It's about the study of uh, spaces. Yeah. The, the, uh, it's, so it's like geometry, but without the angles and distances. Okay. It's just how things are kind of connected to each other or right. not connected. So, in sense. so how much, if it's the case yeah. that this idea of the infinite set mm, maybe is a little wonky, I think you can rescue calculus. Some people think you need the actualized infinity to get to to make calculus work. I don't think that's the case. No, I think you can. Yeah, yeah you can I do think, an awful lot without it. Yeah, I think calculus. you can. But how much? higher mathematics do you think would have a foundational error if it is true that my suspicions about an actualized infinity or an infinite set are correct? For, for analytic topology, um, if we reject the axiom of infinity and just try to rescue as much as we can, um, 
it's, it's almost as though either you go with A, you can rescue almost none of it, or B, you invent a new game and call it formalism and make it all finite and say, well, here's the rules, and then we just import it into that rule. And it's like, okay, here's a, a game that doesn't actually mean much. Um, I mean, of course, if you can prove a contradiction from the axioms, then yeah, the whole thing falls apart and it's totally unrescuable. Um, but in terms of rescuing it, in terms of a, a, an intuition, then yeah, I guess there's very little. I mean, I'll take an example. I mean, um, we're, we're talking about points and sets of points, and indeed sets of points that contain infinitely many points. There's this particular question that's asked, um, was asked quite a long time ago, about 100 years ago, I guess, or so, which is whether or not you can have a two-point set. Now, a two-point set, now, not just a set with two points, but it's a subset of the plane. It's a subset of you know, the reals across the reals, and we, we have these actualized infinities such that um, it meets every straight line in exactly two points. And you might start to play around with this idea and think of like maybe I can do a, like a, a parabola with some extra bit on the side or a circle, you know, or a line. You can think in ge geometric terms, is there a solution to this? So any straight line meets it in two points, can you prove it? Constructively, there is no such constructive proof. But um, using the ac these axioms in infinity and particularly the axiom of choice, you can do a kind of transfinite induction recursive thing that says, line up all of the lines of which there are continuum many and induct all the way through this like infinite upon infinite sequence and on every line we put two points if there aren't points already there and you get this complete mess of points okay and then and then you say okay so we've got these things what can we learn about them we learn you know can can you show that the complement is path connected can you show that this thing is necessarily zero dimensional because there's no such zero dimensional so there's an awful lot of people oh yeah this is an exciting interesting object we study all these things yeah you know, obviously, if there's no concept of an actualized infinity, most of this stuff, in an intuition sense, right. is, in the, is in, the, in the frying pan, it's gone. Right? right. You and could only rescue it in the sense that actually all our proofs are finite, we'll, we'll make a new game of finite length proofs right. and play with that. That's all you can really now, do with it. Yeah. A huge part of my own work is investigating foundations of yeah. fields, philosophy, economics, religion, mathematics, yeah. geometry, all of these things, that's what I'm interested in, the foundation. Yeah. And it seems like, maybe this is my own ignorance on the topic, yeah. that there's a great number, a huge amount of work about yeah. what follows from square two onward. Oh, yeah, Square yeah, two, yeah. three, four, five, six. But not as much about square one. I mean, and it, this strikes on the earliest observation you made about mathematicians right. that people have, that mathematicians have got this kind of like perfect art form of right. immaculate, clear logic. Right. It's not clear if you start worrying about step one. Because, right. you know, if you have step one and somebody's made a mistake at step one, that's their problem. Now, you just get to do ands and ors and nots and exactly. rules. You even put, say, the law of excluded middle in those base assumptions and you can do your non-constructive proofs. Right. It's all the game then and you can see when somebody else has gone wrong. I mean, that's the pure part of mathematics, but, but yeah, if, if you start worrying about step one, then it all goes to pot. So people, the mathematicians don't like to, they don't like to, right. because that, you know. Now, do you think that's a reasonable position to take, is say, hey, how no. about we start investigating? <laughs> well, well, I mean, I mean depends, what do you mean by reasonable? I mean, in a sense, um, I mean, I play Go for two yeah. years. I mean, yeah. it's not reasonable in the sense that it's doing something productive in the real world, but it's a fun thing to do. If it turns out that the rules of Go are somehow self-contradictory, I don't think that they are. <laughs> or if everyone gives up, it, I mean, the thing is, I mean, studying Go, I mean, you could be the only person in the universe and you could study Go. It's just as pointless as most other academic, you know, you want to feed yourself and clothe yourself and things. But Go is somehow rewarding to study because yeah. lots of other people out there also play by the same rules and then you can interact with them and have fun with them and converse. Right. And for me, set theory is very, very similar. I mean, I studied set theory for many years. I went and studied Go. I came back to set theory. I was studying Go while I was doing set theory it's very similar the, the motivation for learning and studying this field is because other people you can talk with them about it and I feel there's an awful lot of that going on in mathematics a lot of people just don't care they're just taking their, their check and they, I, now, they play their game that is also my suspicion but I can't yeah. say that because I don't have a PhD in mathematics from Oxford so people say, say Steve you're a crank if you make these kind of criticisms <laughs> you're not allowed to say that until yeah, yeah. you do actually go through the system and I have tried to demonstrate in many areas well no the, the one that I think resonates with people is in theology there's a massive amount of work that theologians have produced based on the assumption that a God exists. And I actually have the belief that there's something like a God, but precisely what that means. But if that assumption is incorrect... Then there's a lot of wasted work. Yeah. A lot of wasted work, and it's not... I don't have to have a degree in theology to be able to see that that is an obvious fact, especially when something like the existence of God or something like the existence of an infinite set is really hard to wrap your head around. It seems yeah. like... It, it doesn't it seem like yeah. what what a proper mathematical education would consist of is working 
uh, from the foundations, yeah, right? Maybe work, you know, well, arithmetic. You be careful there because you just, you know, damned the idea of working from the foundations. You've got to study and consider the foundations. That's a philosophy. Well, well, yeah. Well, I guess again, maybe this is, again is my bias. I, I think yeah. in order for somebody to have a genuine understanding of mathematics or whatever field is, they have to start with some philosophy. Because I can see people dedicate their entire lives to some theological idea that's foundationally flawed. I think it happens all the time. Mm -hmm. And my suspicion, much to my surprise before examination, is that mathematicians are doing the same thing. Okay. Um, because there's fundamental assumptions that don't seem to be challenged. I, I still feel like a lot of mathematicians, it's not really a case of... Again, it comes more down to, at that level, it definitely seems to come more down to being consistency. In fact, I recall uh, one particular lecture I was attending where uh, something about foundational stuff came up at one point, and uh, one of the, because I had two supervisors technically, I mean, one that was my actual supervisor and one that was more of a, an austere person that was associated with the university, 80-year-old, uh, really nice guy. Uh, but yeah, he was, he was quite clear on his, well, you know, we all, what we care about is consistency, not, you know, whether or not these things particularly reflect any other thing. I mean, modeling it and applying something else. So I feel like a lot of mathematicians who still say, um, you can say that in pure mathematics, and I think it is still kind of understood and believed in pure mathematics, and a lot of it, you can say, is just not useful, you know, because is there anything that you can, which applies to all of those axioms? Well, if there isn't, then the results are not so useful. If there is, then they're of limited use. So, right. you know. So this is a great segue to I, your own It's experience. not so much as saying that you know, what we find out, we discover that, that sets are wrong, uh, but rather just, oh, okay, so what we mean is the thing that is defined by these axioms. Or, and I say the thing, as I say, many people would have different conceptions of to what a set is. Right. Yeah. Sorry, what were you... So this is a great segue to your own experience yeah. in academia. So you have a PhD from one of the most prestigious universities in the world, yeah. on mathematics, yeah. why are you not in academia? What, why am I not in academia? Yeah. <laughs> what was your experience that would well, lend you to, to not be there? Anymore? Well, as I say, I mean, I, I was attracted into it, uh, mainly because I like mathematics. I went through school, I enjoyed maths, I enjoyed the fact that uh, I could solve these problems, you know, that I could, there was something very attractive and intuitive about uh, these problems, and I have to say, even including things like the diagonalization arguments and the screw, square root of two is rational and Pythagoras theorem, all these kinds of things were intuitive and interesting to take the assumptions work on with them. I went through the particular academic system. Mm -hmm. When you're coming out the other end, uh, when you're getting out of the PhD and towards you know, writing papers and trying to justify grants and whatnot, you know, all of a sudden you find that the, the puzzles that are being set are no more just you know, testing that you can that you can think and reason and improve your ability to think and reason, you know, that kind of exercise and fun, but rather you're setting the problems yourself, or rather other mathematicians are setting the problems and you're answering them, and, and to what end? You very much get this kind of feeling of futility coming around when, you know, uh, much like if you took a computer game which had 30 preset problems and then a level editor, you play the preset problems and then you'd lose interest quite quickly unless you had a group, large group of people doing the same thing. For me, it just seemed very... In the end, it just seemed very incestuous. The whole motivation, the whole idea of uh, you're writing a paper because some person asked a question, and you you dedicate you know 50 years of 50 hours of your life trying to solve that, right. and you write something up, and then you pose some other idle thoughts, and somebody else starts to answer them. And actually, um, if you were to really try and unpack it and un unpin it, you could find there are probably eight or nine different people that are actually answering the same fundamental question just with different terms because they haven't really communicated properly with each other. And again, the motivation is not to learn more about mathematics, it's to convince funding bodies that you are doing something worthwhile. And that's right. why it's nice to maintain this image of mathematics is so austere and august and above, you know, just so that you know, I'll just give them money and they'll do clever things, mathematicians. Right, right. Even you know. if they don't understand I, the I work suspect the same kind of thing is happening in theoretical physics for a large degree. Yes. Because it's, and, it's very and in philosophy and yeah. sociology. <laughs> I think it's shot throughout academia. But it's, so. you know, it's not something that I ever really conceived of when I went in to do the degree. And even with the PhD, I was still, you know, I was very much enjoying the, the degree. But from the PhD, I didn't, I just, you know, at the end of the day, you can only spend so many years studying a game of board game like Go or I don't play it so much anymore, or studying ZFC right. until you, know, you realize you want to make some money and, and live your life. I just wanted to do it productively. You know, I wanted to do something that helps other people. And for me, that's not mathematics. Now, in not your, modern mathematics. In your yeah. actual education, um, yeah. 
when you were getting your PhD, how much was folk, How much of it was the philosophy of mathematics? How much? Of, how much of it was dealing with foundational questions like through the degree? How do we mean, generate? Yeah, when you were actually no. in school, none. Um, like questions yeah. like how do we get the continuum? Does it? Does the continuum make sense? How do we work through the logic? Well, obviously, when you do something like uh, real analysis, what they'll do is they'll start from the first lecture and they'll uh, give you the axioms and say these are the axioms of real analysis. And then the very first thing you're doing is trying to prove things like one equals zero, just using the axioms, not using the intuition you might have had from before in school about what numbers are, but just using these axioms. Now, is there but not studying why. No. Is there any explanation of the axiom? It seems like we should try to explore why we would assert there different is, axioms and why they are axioms. From my from my memory, from first, second, and third year, there was effectively no exploration of the issues of why or how these particular axioms are motivated. In the fourth year, for set theory, people were motivating things like um, the reason we added the axiom of foundation, or rather von Neumann added the axiom of foundation, was because we had problems like you know, Russell's paradox. So we touched on it a little bit, but honestly, any of the foundational stuff that I learned about mathematics was more when I went to maths, uh, went to philosophy lectures uh, just in my own time, not part of the official course. I had a friend that was doing maths and philosophy, uh, who was particularly interested in, in the foundations of mathematics, but also of uh, language. Um, but yeah, he would often come to me and say, well, look at these cool ideas and puzzles, and you know, interesting to study a bit more. So I went to a few lectures, but as I say, I didn't study it formally. But, yeah, he's not encouraged. This reminds me of, um, in physics, you mentioned uh, physics earlier. I was having a conversation yeah. with a guy from Oxford. Yeah. Um, about this, and specifically in quantum physics, there are, as I'm sure you're aware, lots of remarkable claims that have been met and yes. made about the nature of quantum mechanics. Yeah. And apparently, there is this idea. There's a phrase in academia: yeah. "Shut up and calculate." That's the phrase where it's like, when we try to ask the question, "What are we actually claiming about the world?" Yeah. Things start getting a little bit fuzzy, and so the response is, "Well." just do the calculations. Like, this is the game that we're playing, this is the game that we're studying, we've got yeah. all these problems that we've set up. I would suspect that, that, I mean, I have a close friend who did physics, um, he did the degree, PhD, he did a postdoc in America, um, he was a particle physicist, um, but yeah, it seems that uh, there's very much this uh, impression, particularly from first year onwards, it's that you kind of have to do away with all of these issues that are for loftier, more philosophical people and just spend each week learning and studying how to do the calculations so that you can get to that front of the field and be productive. If you spent the first two years doing the philosophical, well-trodden ground that all of the other people have already done, you don't accept these things at face value, then you'll just end up being two years behind everyone else when you realize inevitably that this is true because the philosophers have discovered it. So, so it's, it's, you know, it's outsourced. So it's more about the, <laughs> the career of yeah, being yeah. a physicist than yeah. it is about You've exploring got to be able to the do ideas. All of these, yeah. Well, on that note, I want to thank you for this conversation. It sounds sure. like the, uh, yeah, this is go the music has started on, so thanks. This has been great. Okay, thank you very much. All right, that was my interview with my new friend, Gareth. I hope you guys enjoyed it. I hope it piqued your curiosity, and I hope it made very, very clear to you, as it will be in the coming years, that it is okay to be skeptical about some foundational claims in mathematics. There is plenty of room for doubt here. The orthodoxy should be questioned. Maybe they're right, maybe they're wrong. If it's the case that you only think it's clear-cut obvious that infinite sets are logically airtight and there's no problems with them, that is a reflection of your own ignorance on the topic, my friend. If you want to truly understand the subject matter, you can't simply repeat what you've been told in class or what you see in your textbooks. I'm afraid that amount of information is way, way too limited and it won't expose you to the real conversations that have been going on his historically and should be going on at the present. But in my opinion, it is a scandal that these ideas are not discussed within the halls of academia. And you've got a bunch of PhDs all around the world who aren't as intellectually curious as Gareth, who go around thinking that they're masters in some particular area of mathematics that includes the presupposing ideas in set theory all the while having absolutely no idea about the foundational challenges of some base-level concepts in their own field. Naturally, I've got a million more things to say on this topic. I really do hope that you start this journey with me in examining the foundations of mathematics. 
If you valued this conversation, and I hope you did, check out patreon.com slash Steve Patterson, and you can become a patron of the show. You just chip in a buck or two whenever I release new content, and it helps keep the show and the journey continuing. All right, that's all for me today. I hope you guys enjoy the rest of your week.